Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Osteosarcoma Research, presented by Luke Tattersall. I'm Alexis Carls of Labberts, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. You can submit questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled, Ask a Question, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to, of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Luke Tattersall, Postdoctoral Research Associate, the University of Sheffield Medical School. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Luke, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction and for to inviting me to present this webinar. If you don't follow me already, please see my Twitter, which is at Dr. L. Tattersall 24, or Instagram at Luke's Lab Bible. The work carried out in our lab has been funded by the Bone Cancer Research Trust and Hannah's Wilbury Wonder Pony. So I recommend that you visit their website also. So to start with, there are different types of bone cancer. Primary bone cancer originates in the bone, where a secondary bone cancer spreads to the bone from other locations, such as a breast cancer, a prostate cancer, or a lung cancer. They then travel in the blood or the lymphatic system and colonize the bone, where they then form a new tumor. In this presentation, I will be focusing on osteosarcoma, which is a type of primary bone cancer. So primary bone cancer then is split into different subtypes, including osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and chordoma, which account for approximately 85% of all cases. There are also some rarer subtypes, such as spindle cell sarcoma of the bone, adamantinoma, angiosarcoma, and giant cell tumor of the bone. Osteosarcoma is the most common type of primary bone cancer and is of mesenchymal origin. It occurs as a cancer of the osteoblasts or of their precursor cells. These cells are responsible for the production of new bone during normal skeletal remodeling. Osteosarcoma commonly occurs in the limbs, specifically in the metathesis region of the bone. This is the area of the bone containing all the proliferating cells. Osteosarcoma can actually occur in any bone of the body. However, common regions such as around the knee I've highlighted on the slide. You can also see an osteosarcoma tumor originating in the bone and where it's invading into the surrounding tissue. So osteosarcoma then is considered a, a rare disease and it occurs at a rate of one to five people per million per year. Males are slightly affected more than females, and it most commonly affects young people between the age of 10 to 25, but it has a peak age of incidence at 18. There is, however, a second peak of incidence in people over 50, but this can be due to other bone conditions, for example, such as Paget's disease. The five-year survival rate for osteosarcoma is around 60 to 70%, but this reduces to 20 to 30% with metastasis. And the most common place that metastasis is found in osteosarcoma is in the lungs. Uh, an important point is that osteosarcoma survival statistics have remained the same for a number of decades. So osteosarcoma then presents with a number of symptoms, including bone pain, tenderness, or a lump or swelling, problems with mobility, a bone fracture, tiredness and weight loss, muscle loss, easy bruising or an unexplained limp and actually painkillers will not really help with the pain which can come become worse at night 
because the disease is quite rare, GPs don't really come across it in their career. And some of the symptoms that they can see, they can attribute to growing pains or trauma, such as, for example, a sporting act, act, in, act a sporting injury, um, leading uh, to a misdiagnosis. And then this can then delay uh, how quickly they get treated. So when diagnosing osteosarcoma, although imaging techniques such as x-rays, CT scans and MRI scans are used, uh, to aid the diagnosis, for an actual definitive osteosarcoma diagnosis, a biopsy is required uh, with the cells then being examined by an experienced pathologist. So because osteosarcoma so commonly occurs in the limb, amputation was the traditional treatment. An alternative is where surgeons can do rotation plastic. This is where they take a portion of the limb, remove it, and they move the ankle joint up and reattach it at the knee backwards, so this enables the ankle joint to become a functional knee joint, uh, meaning that uh, it has increased function in, with the limb when the prosthetic is attached. So this increases mobility for the patient and is uh, given to, for example, younger patients that want to still remain active. So additionally to this, limb salvage techniques can be used in combination with neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy which is used to initially shrink the tumor size before surgery and then to kill any remaining cells after surgery. The chemotherapy for osteosarcoma consists of methotrexate, doxorubicin, cisplatin, and iphosphamide. Additionally, MEPACT has also been recently approved for treatment of osteosarcoma and is used for patients with non-metastatic osteosarcoma. But again, importantly, the Standard treatment for osteosarcoma hasn't changed for around 30 years since the introduction of chemotherapy. So just to carry on with the treatments, limb salvage surgery can be done in a number of ways. It can be done by an autologous bone graft. This is where healthy bone is taken from a different part of the patient's body to replace the damaged part. Or you can have an allograft, which is used with the bone from someone else. You can also remove the bone and irradiate it and put it back into the patient. However, in osteosarcoma, the majority of cases, the bone is replaced with a metal implant made specifically for the patient. However, this may then need to be adjusted in the future if the patient is still young and they're still growing. So... Moving on to the research that we do. So uh, we do research uh, in vitro to start with. So this is using cell lines in the lab that uh, were originally from patients, but then uh, were immortalized so we can use them uh, over and over. So common human osteosarcoma cell lines include TE85, MNNG HOS, SEOS2, and 143B. The TE85s are immature osteoblasts, SEOS 2s are mature osteoblasts. MNNG HOS is a derivative of the TE85 cell line, which was treated with MNNG, a carcinogen, uh, and is an osteogenic and osteolytic cell line. The 143B is again a derivative of the TE85 and is a highly aggressive, highly osteolytic, and highly metastatic cell line. Common mouse cell lines include the Dunn cell line and its derivative LM8. K7 and its derivative K7M2. And the way these derivatives are produced is they will inject the cells into the mouse, let them metastasize to the lungs, and then collect those and keep repassaging them into the mouse and keep uh, doing that over and over. That's why LMA is called LMA because it took eight times to do this until you establish this new metastatic derivative of those cell lines. A final mouse cell line that's used is called MOSJ. And in addition to this, there are also rat and canine cell lines that are available, such as UMR106, which was from an experimental rat, and D17, which was isolated from a poodle, because dogs can be susceptible for osteosarcoma as well. So they can actually provide a, a clinical model also. So cells uh, you, like this can be used for a number of different experiments that we, use in, that we do in the lab. So we look, for example, at the cell growth over a number of days. We look at their migration, invasion, adhesion, or their response to drug treatments. 
And specifically in our lab, we use human cells because they're more representative than animal cells and they have human-specific proteins that we want to target. They're also relatively cheap. They're easily available. I don't have any ethical considerations. However, on the other hand, if you were to then put these human cells in a mouse, you'd have to use a mute mice, which is immunocompromised, so that the cells aren't rejected by the host. So obviously, you're not taking into consideration your immune response there. So that's a disadvantage of that. So with these cells, we perform in vivo studies, and the way we do it in our lab is we perform a paratibial injection of the cells into the mouse. So this is where I take the mouse, I anesthetize it, uh, and with the needle to inject the cells, I scratch the surface of the bone to ensure that the periosteum is activated and that the cells are in, injected into a relevant location. So because of this, as we're analyzing the bone, it's important to ensure that the paratibial injection doesn't actually damage the bone. So to do this, what we did is we scratched the bone and didn't inject any cells. We then confirmed that there was no difference when viewing the bone or when analyzing this by micro CT. So we could then analyze our important bone volume characteristics without, with knowing that that wasn't caused by our injection method. So, in osteo so here um, is the mice where they have formed osteosarcoma tumors on the slides, and you can see that they have these large osteosarcoma tumors coming from the bone, which become palpable after nine days. You can actually start treatment on them as soon as you inject them, or you can wait until the tumor is formed uh, and then give a treatment. We also give chemotherapy as a positive control to compare. So we then do uh, analysis of the bone using micro CT. So due to the tumor being osteoblastic, new bone is still being produced called ectopic bone. So remember osteoblasts build the bone, normal bone remodeling, and now they become cancerous, but it doesn't stop them doing their function and they will still produce ectopic bone. So this is typically seen in patients and we see it in our, in our mouse models. This increase in bone volume can be quantified by using micro CT and it's increased when compared to its corresponding right leg, which hasn't been injected. So using this, we can then look to see if any treatments that we've been given to the mice have any effect on reducing this. So in addition to this, we further do analysis of the primary tumor. So when we collect the mice legs from them, we actually leave all the surrounding tissue around them because the entire tumor is half and half, essentially with the, with the bone and the surrounding tissue. So by taking all of it, you, you can see the entire tumor and then you can section this and perform a different experiments, whichever you want. So we do things like histology, which is performed to view the cell characteristics. For example, it's osteoid production. We do trap staining which is used to quantify osteoclasts at the tumor bone interface. So what I mean by this is where the tumor meets the bone and it can be upregulated or downregulated and we're able to measure this. We can also do immunistic chemistry, which is performed to detect different markers such as KI67, which is expressed by proliferating cells. So uh, then we can see if our treatments are increasing or decreasing this or we can use an X in five, which is a marker that cells express when they're undergoing cell death. So we can see if your treatments are killing the cells. So this gives a lot of information then about this and we, we perform these immunistic chemistry experiments. Finally, as the lungs are the most common site for osteosarcoma metastasis, we take these from the mice and we check them. So to do this, we serially section the lungs all the way through so that we're taking multiple slides at multiple different points of the lungs and then checking all of them for osteosarcoma metastasis. And we're doing that just so that we don't miss any of the small osteosarcoma cells that might be residing there in the lung. And then these can be, again, stained and examined, and we can see if our treatments are having any effect on osteosarcoma metastasis or not. So to conclude, 
the presentation has given an overview of osteosarcoma primary bone cancer and an insight into osteosarcoma research, both in vitro and in vivo, which we perform uh, in the lab. So I'd finally just like to acknowledge uh, my funding bodies, the Bone Cancer Research Trust and Hannah's World Wonder Wonderpony, the University of Sheffield Medical School, uh, my supervisors, Professor Alison Gartland and Dr. Shelley Lawson, uh, other lab members, including Dr. Karen Shah, uh, Mr. Darren Lav, and Ms. Ms. Jen Down. Uh, thank you, and uh, now I'm open for any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Luke, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. It will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, other than the lung, where else does osteosarcoma metastasize? So the, as I said, the, the most common place is the lungs, but the, uh, the second most common place other than the lungs uh, is the bone. Uh, and what can actually happen is, so in some instances, with these osteosarcoma tumors, they will uh, spread but still colonize the same bone. Uh, and this is called skipped metastasis. So it's where a part of the tumor uh, breaks away from the bone but actually colonizes the same bone that it's come from. Uh, but it can actually, you know, spread to any bone. Uh, other than that, it also spreads to the lymph nodes, uh, and in rarer cases, it can spread to the brain, the liver, uh, or the kidneys. Now, Luke, what is GP? What is? Sorry, what? Uh, what is GP? GP. Uh, a, gen a general practitioner. Uh, I think uh, that would be my guess. <laughs> that would yeah, be doctor. my guess yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's switch to our next question. Do you have yep. any information on osteosarcoma of the jawbone, or is this strictly a course on long bone sarcomas? Uh, so, uh, osteosarcoma of the jaw is very rare, uh, so uh, it's not something I'm too familiar with. Uh, but it, the most common places is the limbs, around 80%. So it does occur in the jaw, uh, and it has similar clinical characteristics as any other osteosarcoma, but it is such a rare, rare, rare thing to happen. It's not something you come across too often. Now, cats are known for not having much of osteosarcoma. Do you have a plan to analyze the biology in cats for osteosarcoma? Uh, I... I haven't any plans to do that no um it's common in large dogs as well uh, and they are used as uh, clinical models for osteosarcoma as well all right luke so our next question is i missed what happened to the bone itself as a result of bone sarcoma developing in bone is ectopic bone growth a source of pain uh yes the most common symptoms of osteosarcoma uh is the uh, yeah, it both, uh, growth of uh, this extra bow around them, and yes, that's uh, one thing that can occur. Do you have any idea why the clinical trials have been failing for osteosarcoma drugs? So, uh, the problem with osteosarcoma is it doesn't actually have one known cause. So, uh, it has a lot of different characteristics in different people. So it's what we call a very heterogeneous disease. So uh, that means that not necessarily one thing will will work for, uh, you know, uh, everyone. Uh, whereas, um, you know, you're trying to develop drugs that will work for, as a general, against osteosarcoma. Uh, and it's such a, a, a uh, such a diverse disease essentially that that's you know a big problem and also you you know the, the standard treatments also become chemo resistance as well so uh, you know it's developing like other things as well but um yeah it's because it's such a diverse disease that, that a lot of clinical trials have, have had problems we are getting some great questions right now so let's continue with our next one 
Luke, do you think there yeah. is a correlation between survival rate and no change in current treatment? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, no treatments are uh, coming coming through. So obviously, yeah, that's affected your your survival rates, and they've they've stayed constant. Now, what other in vivo injections are there other than the paratibial one? So uh, what some lab groups do is they do an intraosseous injection where what they will do is they will direct straight into the bone, so into the bone marrow, and the, the cells will, you know, start growing from there. We we don't do that because, you know, that will, could sort of damage all your, your bone architecture, and we, well, that's one of the things we want to analyze. Uh, other things that uh, are used are a subcutaneous injection, so that's just under the skin, so it's not necessarily in the, the bone microenvironment there. Uh, and in metastatic uh, osteosarcomas, to measure that, what we'll do is inject into the tail vein of the mouse and then just measure the, where the cells are spreading to uh, so that, and how long you know it takes to then get to the lungs and, and compare that, like, for example, with a treatment or without, et cetera. Uh, so now that's just a few of the, the other techniques. Mm -hmm. Now, our next question is going to be a two-part question. What yep, is sure. your general practice getting the DNA, RNA from the bone tissue? And the second part is, do you have to decalcify the tissue, which can lead to DNA, RNA degradation? Yes. When we uh, do the analysis on the, the mice bones, yeah, we decalcify the tissue, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's not something that we can... Uh, account for that yeah we you know when you're doing your immune histochemistry you're essentially cutting into the bone and obviously that would be with the calcium that would be too too hard and you won't be able to cut through it so yeah we do decalcify them uh enable to section the bones so yeah uh and then you can extract uh dna and rna uh from cell lines that's generally what where i've used any from previously now, our next question, is there any genetic predisposition for osteosarcoma? So there are um, instances where in osteosarcoma there are, there are links to other diseases. So, for example, there's a, a link between osteosarcoma and retinoblastoma. So where people have these hereditary cancer syndromes, other than retinoblastoma itself, the secondary um, highest one is osteosarcoma and if you have a retinoblastoma cancer syndrome you're actually around like something like 500 times more likely to get an osteosarcoma tumors uh, and it's the same with uh lifromeni uh disease which is a disease that affects your p53 function uh so um again that's that's another one that's linked to osteosarcoma yeah so th there are a few yeah now, do the bone cells metastasize both by lymph, uh, lymphatic system and blood? Yeah, they do, yeah. So you could, you know, there's, there are some researchers that try and look at circulating tumor cells from the blood uh, as well. So, for example, uh, they'll collect the, the blood of the mice uh, and they can pass it through a machine uh, that will uh, try and detect those circulating tumor cells. And, you know, that can maybe potentially one day aid, you know, a diagnosis. Now, Luke, how many cells do you inject in vivo? So when we're doing it, uh, we generally tend to use around 250,000 to 500,000. Uh, and the reason why that's actually quite low from a, from a cell culture flash, you can actually have millions of cells. Uh, but when, when they're in the animal and the, they're in the bone microenvironment, they do grow really quick. Uh, and then you're actually limited on uh, the size of the tumor in the mouse. Uh, and if you want to get metastasis, you, you need to leave them in there uh, for so long for that to start developing. Uh, so the problem is sometimes that um, you can have a really large primary tumor uh, and then it, the, the mice can start to begin to limp and be in discomfort. And then we, we're not allowed to leave them that long, uh, but like by regulated by law. So uh, we have to take that into consideration. So we generally start off with a lower amount of cells. Uh, in order uh, to try and extend our length of treatment that we can then give to the mice, uh, so it's quite quite low. Uh, there, there are papers, you know, that that have gone higher than that before. For for example, for around you know a million cells in the mice, but we generally use use lower. 
Now, do you use only imaging, or do you analyze the bone histo uh, histologically? Yeah, we, we analyze the bone histologically and from, from the mice, yeah. So we will do things like, you know, uh, take sections, sections of the bone, do immunohistochemistry, uh, and yeah, it's not just imaging. We do a, do a range of different techniques. Now, Luke, our next question. Do you use yeah, patient sure. osteosarcoma samples? So with patient osteosarcoma samples, because it's so rare, it, they are quite hard to get hold of, and it can take years to build up a, a large uh, cohort of osteosarcoma samples. So uh, we, we in the future are aiming to, but we haven't been, been able to at the moment, but uh, we are hoping to, yeah. Uh, and generally when you speak to osteosarcoma patients, from, from my experience, they, they do generally want to, want their osteosarcoma tissue to be used for research, uh, they're generally quite, you know, helpful with that. So it's just uh, a case of actually getting that tissue and then getting it to us researchers. And uh, in, in the UK, uh, the Bone Cancer Research Trust, that they funded my PhD, and they're, they're doing a big uh, sort of infrastructure thing where uh, what they're doing is trying to standardise, like, the procedure between uh, different bone bone research centers so that it becomes more easier to enable access to uh, patient samples yes yeah, so for for researchers like like me uh, to to use that tissue uh, they're trying to make it more available now Luke, does injecting bmp antagonists such as noggin would be use would that be useful to stop bone growth uh i'm not sure about that they're not uh, antagonist that I'm that I'm familiar with, uh, to be honest. Well, let's go to our next question. What is the relationship between Paget's disease and osteosarcoma? So Paget's disease is a disease of the bone as well, uh, and it generally occurs in more older people, uh, and it's a condition involving cellular remodeling. Uh, and deformity, and it's where uh, they see they have dysregulated bone remodeling. Uh, so specifically, they have excess bone breakdown, and sub subsequently they have disorganized new bone formation. Uh, and it, like I say, generally that's in older people, uh, and you know there's no cure for that, and that is uh, sort of been described as a predisposition uh, for for osteosarcoma patients. Uh, but, yeah, it's generally, osteosarcoma is generally sec secondary to that. So, Luke, our, ne our next question has a couple parts to it. So we'll start with the first sure. one. Okay. Which benign tumors lead to osteosarcoma? Um, I'm, so generally all osteosarcomas are, are considered high grade. Uh, I'm not sure which ones actually lead to osteosarcoma there's there's a lot of different subsets that are benign tumors that are separate from osteosarcoma uh, and I'm, i don't think they I'm, I'm not sure about how they they, they do that and now the, the second and third part are is do you work with jaw osteosarcoma and is it the same cell line for jaw and long bone osteosarcoma so good, good question so uh, the cell lines that I used were originally isolated from patients, so they were from, uh, you know, an osteosarcoma of the tibia or of the femur. Uh, I, I haven't used an, uh, a cell line that's from an a, a osteosarcoma from the jaw, no, uh, but it would be uh, good, you know, if, if that was available to, to look at that and, you know, see what the differences were. But it's not something I've really come across. And again, it, it's such a rare disease, osteosarcoma of the jaw, it's... You know, osteosarcoma is rare anyway. Uh, there's a few hundred cases in the UK, so you know, even get going away from that, you know, to a, to an even rarer one, uh, it's not something we we've really come across. Now, here's a piggyback question off one that we had before. You mentioned sure. Paget disease as associated with osteosarcoma. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit more about it? Uh, as a uh, as about Paget's disease. Yes, Paget's disease. Uh, so uh, I'm not too sure. I, I know about osteosarcoma mainly. 
uh, it's you know it's treated with bisphosphonates to try and increase the the bone. Um, you know it's um, the second most common metabolic disorder, disorder after osteoporosis, uh, and you know the it's rare in people that are that are younger. It's more in older people, like like I said earlier. Um, it can have a it can have a um, family history. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know too much about Paget's disease, only that it can be a predisposition for osteosarcoma. Now, our next question. Is increased alkaline phospho, uh, excuse me, phosphatase associated to osteosarcoma? So alkaline phosphatase is a, a marker of bone growth. So uh, because obviously the uh, cancer for osteosarcoma is... Um, in cells that are osteoblasts that are building the bone, then yeah, you, you can get increased alkaline phosphatase, yeah. Now, are those osteosar uh, osteosarcoma cell lines bare TP53 mutations? And are there any other mutations known for them? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, absolutely. I didn't quite catch, I didn't quite catch that. Are the <laughs> no problem. Are those osteosarcoma cell lines bare TP53 mutations, and mm -hmm. are there any other mutations known for them? Uh, so, uh, I'm not I'm not sure about within the cell lines which mutations they have got. They've been uh, chemically transformed in the lab, so they will have a lot of different things wrong with them. They've, uh, you know, like for example, uh, hostiles. They've been treated with MNNG, which is a carcinogen, which makes them more aggressive. So that will, uh, you know. They, that will affect loads of genes and the, the different cell lines. To be honest, so there's a lot of a lot of different things that are, that are different there. Here's another question for you, Luke. What do you think needs to be done for treatment? Um, so, what do I think needs to be done in terms of progressing the treatment? Um, we can actually. If you would, if you would like, we can have um, her. Uh, we can have you put in another question to clarify to clarify that question of what do you think needs to be done for treatment, and yeah, we sure, can. Sure. Yeah, so we'll wait for her. We'll wait for their answer. Um, okay. We'll move on okay. to an, okay. another question. Uh, okay, what sure, risk sure. factors are there for osteosarcoma? Okay, so uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, osteosarcoma doesn't have a known cause. There are some things that are linked to osteosarcoma, so, but it's it's very general thing. So, for example, younger people it affects. Uh, it generally, osteosarcoma patients are taller uh, than average because uh, there's a link there between, you know, the rapid bone growth uh, and having growth spurts. Uh, males, again, are you know, slightly more than females. You know, that could be because they're growing larger, their bones are growing more, uh, and, you know, that's leading to uh, problems there. Uh, there is instances where uh, if you've had a different cancer and they've uh, treated you with radiation for that, that can predispose for osteosarcoma as well. Uh, so, yeah, so that can be considered a risk factor. And then, again, some of the genetic conditions that we that I mentioned earlier, for example, retinoblastoma, uh, defect or lifromenis syndromes or Paget's disease, you know, uh, that sort of things. So there are some risk factors, yeah, for osteosarcoma, but, you know, there, there isn't a known cause. Now, which osteosarcoma cell line is the most metastatic? So the... Uh, human cells for osteosarcoma, the cell lines, the uh, 143B cells are the most metastatic model uh, using the human cells. Uh, so if you put them in the mice, they will, you know, they will form uh, metastasis uh, pretty much in, you know, if you put them in 10 mice, they'd form metastasis in 10 mice. Uh, so they're, they're really, you know, metastatic. Uh, in terms of mice, mouse cell lines that you can use, uh, the LMA is a lung metastatic variant A, uh, and that's a highly metastatic osteosarcoma mouse cell line. Uh, and again, K7M2 is another one uh, that's highly uh, metastatic as well. That's another a mouse one that, that is. So they, they would be, you know, the, the one human and the, the other two mice would be the, the ones that are the most metastatic. Okay, Luke, so our next question. I see jaw osteosarcoma. 
how close are we to a targeted therapy for osteosarcoma, and what is the general path of current research? So uh, I'm not sure how close uh, we are for targeted therapy for osteosarcoma. Uh, the, the, I'm not sure what entire research is out there. The, the research that I'm doing uh, is looking at, for example, uh, developing ways of overcoming chemo resistance. So, you know, in, subset, in some subsets of patients, uh, you know, they they will become, uh, they will have instances where uh, the chemotherapy will stop working, and we're, we're trying to find out why why that is, uh, and what differences in the cells uh, as to why that might occur, uh, and we're doing screening processes uh, to develop new drugs uh, against that at the moment. Uh, so that's why where where go, we're going with with our research at the moment, uh, and the way that we do that is we'll take the cells, give them chemotherapy, uh, which will kill off a lot of the cells, let the subpopulation grow back, uh, keep giving them chemotherapy and letting them grow back like that again and again until eventually chemotherapy is not having any uh, effect, and then uh, you'll have your chemo resistant cell line. So uh, we, for us at the minute, it's more sort of overcoming. Uh, that and developing new things that will overcome that. So that's where like, our research is, is going at the minute. We have had a great question, uh, Q&A session today, but we do only have time for one more, so Luke will finish with this one. Okay. Do you, do you inject into both mice legs in vivo? So the, what we do is, uh, if I was comparing uh, two different mice, then, for example, the um they might may be different sizes so to compare one mice to the other mice wouldn't be accurate so what we do first is we only inject in one leg and then we can essentially normalize that value to its co contralateral leg so we only inject in one but compare it to the other leg that's not been injected because that is essentially a, a normal bone in in that leg there so if we're looking at bone volume we can normalize it to the other bone and see if there's an increase or decrease. Uh, and you, you know, with the ectopic bone, you will generally see, you know, an increase. Uh, and then once that's been normalized, you can then compare your, your different mice. So yes, yeah, so it's only, only one mouse leg that we inject into. Thank you, Luke. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, thank, thank you for listening to my presentation uh, and for asking me lots of great questions. Thank you again, Luke, for your time today and for your important research. We'd also like thank to you. thank Lab Roots and, <laughs> and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through August of 2019. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>